and we saw some 20 times we're getting going. I just want to get started because uh, it is what I like to call Little Friday, Thursday night. So I appreciate you all being here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Ashley Driscoll. I am an attorney with a firm called Barry Elsner and Hammond in Portland. Um, I've been there approximately eight years now. Um, we represent a variety of local governments all across Oregon. And so I think right now we have finally have our eighth attorney. We had a little bit of a little little uh, staffing issue there for a moment, but we have eight attorneys. We are full-time um, representation for 25 entities and have about 30 to 50 um, special projects for other entities going on at any time. So we do a lot of work with local government. Um, I was just joking with Jeff, this is uh, my second time doing this type of presentation in a month. So we see a lot of these issues. Um, before we get started, I end up spending a lot of time in Cannon Beach. I feel like people know my face and who I am. Um, I hear names a lot, but I don't know faces. So if you wouldn't mind um, if we could just introduce ourselves and talk or you know which board of committee you're on, that would be really helpful. We'll start right here. Robin Rosalie, City Council. Uh, Janine Pierce Mushin, Public Works. Barb Bob, Parks and Planning. Stacey Benefield, Farmers Market and Parks. Okay. Uh, that's Sinclair Parks Committee and Planning. Okay. I'm Jan Siebert Warman, and I'm just a volunteer. Perfect. And then on, Jen, could you help me with the people on Zoom, those who are present? Okay, on Zoom, um, we have Clay Newton from the Planning Commission. Hi, Clay. Hi. Good evening. I'm I'm driving. I don't know if you can see me or not. I'm I'm Clay Newton. I'm on the Planning Commission. <laughs> Mike Beats is from the Planning Commission. There's some audio issues, so I can won't be able to speak. Okay. Anita Newer from the Design Review Board. Mm -hmm. And Parks. And Parks. Yep. Uh, Councilor Brandon Ogilvy. No one. Yep. Aaron Matusik from the Planning Commission. Hi, okay. Ashley. Hey. And Mickey Moritz from the Planning Commission. Okay. Hi there. Thanks for coming, Ashley. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Um, okay, so let's get started. So as I mentioned, um, I've done quite a few of these presentations and I think the place to start is thank you. Um, you know, being a board of commission member, being a city council member, it takes up a substantial amount of your time. Uh, and I know the city really appreciates all the time you give the city and especially spending what I hope is less than 90 minutes with me going through an ethics training on Little Friday um, is a big sacrifice of your time. So I'm gonna be going through a lot of the laws that govern um, public officials who are typically volunteers. And I think sometimes at the end of this presentation, um, people feel like some of these laws are a little onerous. There are you know, some penalties for violating the laws. I think it's important to, re to remember that these laws really only apply to 99.9% .9 of folks. If you're here at this training, they likely, uh, you know, you're likely not going to run afoul of them. So they apply to you, but you're likely not going to run afoul of them, especially if you're interested in learning about them and ways to avoid them. Um, so I will try to respect your time and try to go through this in about 90 minutes. Sometimes I can get through it quicker. I like to balance um, telling some stories and providing some color to the different legal issues with respecting, with respecting your time. So I will provide examples. None of them will be from Cannon Beach or anywhere near Cannon Beach. Um, I am pretty careful about, about which examples I'm going to use with the exception of the shingles. I will definitely talk about the shingles. Um, okay, so, so the goals for tonight, um, you don't need to be an expert. So as volunteers, this is to give you an idea of some of the laws that govern public officials and issues to be aware of. My expectation is not by the end of this presentation that you're going to know the ins and outs of all of the public ethics meetings and public records laws. My goal for tonight is that by the end of the presentation, you know what issues to look for and you know who to ask for questions. So as in, I like to know an agenda before I go into any presentation. So this is our agenda for tonight. So first we're gonna discuss authority and that is mostly how local government works. Where do you fit in as your role in a, as a member of a board of commission? I'm going to talk about the Oregon government ethics laws. So that's abuse of office, how you deal with conflicts of interest. I'm going to talk about public meetings, and then I'm going to talk about public records. 
There are some issues that I think are more important to cover and I'm gonna give them more time. Other issues such as public records, I'm just going to kind of cruise through that and let you know what the highlights are, let you know what issues to be aware of. But as board and commissioners, you're not responding to public records requests. So you don't need to know the ins and outs of which records are exempt and which are not. And then at the end, we're gonna have a little time um, for Q and A. And at the end of these topics, each one of these topics, I'm gonna pause for questions. So I'm gonna try to get through the general topic. And then if you have a question, we can ask that, go through that before we move on to the next topic. Okay, so the first topic I wanna talk about is authority. So Cannon Beach is structured with the city council and the city council has all of the authority that it has not otherwise delegated. So the city council has all the decision-making power for the city, unless it has delegated that to an individual such as the city manager through the charter or has delegated that authority to one of your boards and commissions. I saw an email from Bruce this week that to the city council and potential city council members mentioning that the city council meets between eight and 10 times a month. That is a very significant um, meeting schedule for a local government with, with a volunteer city council. And I think it goes to show how much work the city council does. The city council, members of the city council are asked to carry a really heavy load in almost any city, but especially one like Cannon Beach that has so many big projects going on. City council members are also required to be up to speed on a variety of issues facing the city and to be knowledgeable enough about those issues to make really important decisions that affect everybody within the city. So because that is such a heavy load, they delegate some of that authority and some of the work that goes into making the best decision for the city to advisory boards and commissions. So the city of Cannon Beach has nine advisory board committees and decision-making commissions. Most of the boards and commissions are advisory only. So because the city council has to know about so many different areas, they have delegated authority to the Public Works Commission or the Parks and Rec Commission to really delve into some issues specific to that area and then make recommendations to the city council about how they think the city should best approach that issue. The city council can then hear the recommendation, hear the issues on both sides, and then make its own independent decision, taking their advisory board's recommendation into mind. There are some occasions where a board and commission, specifically the planning commission, has been delegated authority to make a decision on its own. So a planning commission decision will stand unless appealed to the city council. Most other board and commissions are just making a recommendation to the city council. So each of the board of commissions is unique in terms of its size, its meeting schedule, its specific function. However, the overall mission is the same. Again, from my perspective, it's to relieve some of the load of the city council, but also involve more citizens in the working of the city. The more um, engaged community members, the better local government typically runs. So these local board of commission seats and positions provide an opportunity for more people within the city to get involved and give recommendations to the council. So I touched on this a little bit. Um, council appointed uh, boards and commissions are responsible to an advisory to the city council, unless the council has delegated specific responsibility for independent action. So if you're interested in you know, what authority has been delegated to your specific board and commission, that's all online. You go to the city code, you go to administration, you find your board and commission and you can see exactly what kind of authority the city council has delegated to that specific board and commission. And that is your authority. You're only authorized to act on behalf of the city within that authority that has been delegated, either through the municipal code or you know, through other action by the city council. The city council can always say, you know, yes, we have a, a arts board and commission. We haven't asked them before to weigh in on you know, whether or not a theater group should come to town. However, you know, we've been asked this question, we would like the Arts Board to weigh in on that. It's not an official delegated authority through the municipal code, but the city council can always make the decision to ask that group to weigh in on a specific issue. So again, generally these groups just make re recommendations to the city council. Um, on rare occasions, they are actually making final decisions on behalf of the city. Um, so I think this is a interesting issue. So 
authority as a board and commission member or authority as a city council member. So generally speaking, neither the charter or the municipal code grant power to an individual, an individual mem member of a board or a commission to act on behalf of their body or their city. One of the exceptions to that is the mayor. The mayor has been delegated some authority to act as an individual, for instance, preside over the meetings, sign documents on behalf of the city, be the political head of the city. But generally speaking, as an individual member of a board of commission or the city council, you do not have any additional authority over and above what a member of the public has. So this comes up sometimes in public records. You know, a member of the a board of commission or a member of a city council would, will ask for, you know, public records. Well, are you asking on behalf of the board? Are you authorized to ask on behalf of the board? Or are you asking as a member of your board and, of board and commission? And if the answer is, you know, I'm just asking on behalf of myself, then, you know, you have to do a public records request. If you're acting on behalf of your board of commission, has that board of commission authorized you to make that public records request? Uh, members of board and commission are expected to abide by the decision of their body, whether or not they are, they are a member who voted on the prevailing side. So when this one comes up, um, it takes me back to, um, to what I refer to as the marijuana days when marijuana was legalized in Oregon. And I spent a good year of my time going to public meetings specifically about marijuana. Um, in one of the meetings that I went to, a member of the Economic Development Commission was, um, was required to come speak to the city council regarding the recommendations of the Economic Development Commission. And the Economic Development Commission believes strongly in authorizing marijuana to come to this specific town. The chair of that board disagreed with that decision. So when he was doing the presentation on behalf of the Economic Development Commission, he was bound to give their recommendation. However, when it came to public comment, he could come up during public comment and say, here's my personal opinion about this. When he was acting on behalf of his body, he had to give, um, he had to give the opinion of the body, but he had time to give his personal opinion as well. I'm just gonna take a drink really quick. I think it's important to understand when you're making a distinction between when you're speaking up, when you're authorized to speak, and when you're speaking as a, um, when you're giving a personal opinion. So that one's a pretty easy topic. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So attendance, attendance at any board commission meeting is sent by that individual board. Um, and the staff liaison position, I'm sorry. Wait a second. This is being recorded, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can't stay for too long. Oh. <laughs> like, it's like, ah. Have you ever had one of those moments where, like, your just heart starts beating and you don't really know why? <laughs> that just happened to me. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so staff liaison position it is pretty, pretty, um, pretty straightforward. The staff liaison is somebody who's assigned to your board of mission. They come to your board and commission meeting. Their role is just to provide staff support to that meeting. And also to bring back the desires of the board and commission to staff and council to start being able to implement those. They're non-voting members. So the same is true for your council liaison role. They're non-voting member of the board and commission. They're again to help the board and commission follow the delegated authority from city council. Um, they're non-voting. And their role, again, how I see the staff liaison, the council liaison position, is that both are designed to bring the expertise necessary to this volunteer group, and then to also ensure that the volunteer group is following the direction that's been delegated by the city council and um, bring the city council back what they need. So that's the end of um, the structure and the delegation of authority. Are there any questions about that before I move on to government ethics? Okay. Um, so I think this is the real meat and potatoes of what we're going to be talking about. 
there are six or seven different sections of the Oregon government ethics laws. The ones that I'm touching on tonight are the ones that I think are most important for you to know. Those are abuse of office, conflicts of interest, and then penalties. If you have questions about reporting requirements, I can answer those. Nepotism, that doesn't come up too much, but can definitely answer questions. And then the Oregon Ethics Commission, I can talk about that as well. So do the Oregon government ethics laws apply to me? You know, I'm just a member of the library board. The answer is, is yes, they do. So anybody who has been delegated authority to act um, as part of a board doing the city business will be a public official under the Oregon government ethics laws. So the first one I want to talk about is um, it's ORS 244-040, and this is abuse of office. So this is the one that comes up, I would say, the most often, and it sounds very straightforward, but they are somewhat I would refer to as sneaky elements to it. So public officials may not use or attempt to use their position to obtain financial gain or avoid a financial detriment that they would not otherwise, that would not otherwise be available to them, but for the holding of the official public position. The basic requirement here, the basic concept is that you should not be getting a financial benefit because of your role with the city. I think that's pretty obvious to anybody who is a volunteer with the city, and it's pretty obvious to anybody who lives within the city that you would want your financial or you would want your public officials not to gain any benefit that they wouldn't have but for their involvement with the city. However, the Oregon law is a little bit more expansive than that. So the, the abuse of office applies not only to you, but also to your relatives. And the relatives is a decently long list. So your spouse, your parent, your step-parent, your child, um, the parent, stepchild, sibling, spouse, son-in-law of your spouse, any individual for whom the public official has a legal obligation support, any individual from whom the candidate receives benefits arising from the individual's employment, and any member of your household. So when you're thinking about abuse of office, and we'll talk about it with conflicts too, it's not just you. So for instance, you know, is your child receiving a benefit and they're receiving a benefit that they would not receive but for your involvement with the city? Is your spouse receiving that? So again, you have to look at both you and this long list of people who are also related to you. Are they, getting a benefit or avoiding a financial detriment that they wouldn't get, but for your work with the city. And then secondly, it also applies for a business for which you're associated. So if you are an employee at, you know, a bakery in town and, you know, that bakery is getting a benefit that they wouldn't get, but for your employment or but for your involvement with the city, this law is going to be triggered. So a business for which you're associated is if a person is a director, officer, owner, employer, agent of the business, or the person owns or has owned more than $1,000 of stock, equity, or stock options, or debt interest. Um, a public health corporation, if the person is an officer or director of a publicly traded company, or has owned more than $100,000 of stock. Essentially, any type of source of income is going to be considered a business for which you are associated. So examples, um, the one that I wrote in was Mike Morgan talked about the shingles. So let's, let's talk about that one. Um, so as a member of the design review board, if he is offered the shingles, if, you know, it, you know, sure, Mike, come down and you can take the shingles off my building. If he does that and that's not open to all other members of the public on an equal basis, that will be considered an abuse of office because that is a benefit that he is getting that is worth more than $50 that he wouldn't have gotten but for his role here at the city. However, if that, um, you know, if that applicant makes that available is like, hey, anybody who wants it can come down to my property and take all the, all the shingles they want, Mike Morgan is free to do that. Um, another one that has come up more than I would like to, like to mention is the second one which is members of the Parks and Community Services Board receive free VIP passes to the local softball, softball tournament. So this one comes up in various, um, in various different ways. It actually came up just a couple of weeks ago with one of my clients. A city manager called and said, 
you know, this concert venue is looking for places to go in Oregon. They're really interested in this city. What do you think about allowing the city council to go to one of these con concerts and see what it's about? So when it comes before the city council, they have an idea of what they're voting on. My first question is like, yeah, I mean, that sounds great. You know, like it does, it will help them make their decision, but how much of those concert tickets work? And what it came back is those concert tickets were worth like $175. So that's like a screech to the halt. Like, no, you know, you can't give members of the city council tickets that are valued at $175 just because you want them to see what this concert venue is like, because really what it looks like to anybody from the outside is that they're being bought is that these folks are going to be applicants in front of the city council at some point, and, you know, they have sort of greased their wheels with some free concert tickets. So that one comes up a lot. Um, a public works member using his role as a public works to lobby the city to award a maintenance contract to his sister. So again, it's not him, it's his sister, or even to take it out, a business that his sister works for. She could be the receptionist, um, you know, in a big corporate office, and the public works committee member can believe that, you know, this is in the interest of the city, but it's still going to be abuse of office because if the city um, makes the decision to hire that company, it's going to financially benefit a business for which one of his relatives are associated with. So that's where this kind of gets more complicated than as a city councilor, as a commission member, I can't benefit financially from my role. That's easy. As you get to the more, if you get kind of to the outside, these are more difficult questions that won't necessarily like raise a red flag initially that I need to ask about this, or I need to make sure that it's okay for me to be involved in this transaction. So another one, um, this one also comes up quite a bit. A public works employee borrows the city's public, public water power washer to prepare his house for painting. So he's taking the power washer home, rental value of that power washer is, you know, $50 an hour. He has it for three hours. That's a financial benefit he wouldn't get, but for his role with the city. Another one, just to keep going on some of these examples, is a famous case in the state of Oregon. A officer with the state of Oregon was buying a fleet of four Tauruses. And in buying, you know, 24 Tauruses at once, he got a substantial discount. You know, they're being sold, they retail at $15,000. The state was getting on them for 10. He thought, great deal. I'm going to get myself a Ford Taurus. In doing that, he got a financial benefit that members of the public didn't get that he wouldn't have gotten but for his role with the state. And so he was found in violation of the Oregon Public Ethics Laws. One thing to be aware of is gifts. So there are some exceptions. So any part of an official compensation package, that's not going to be abuse of office. That makes sense. You know, this covers public employees too. Like, of course, they're being paid for their work. That monetary benefit they're getting, but for their public employment, is their compensation package. So this is all about transparency. As long as that is an officially adopted compensation package, you can also have officially um, official compensation packages for boards and commissions that include you know, iPads for use as their board and commission members or some sort of insurance. All of that can be part, can be given to board and commission members as part of their official compensation package. You can also do honorariums at a max value of 50. And then clearly like reimbursement for expenses, un unsolicited awards for professional achievement. I love that one. Who's out there soliciting awards for their professional achievement and then getting money from it. Um, Gifts from a source that could not reasonably have a legislative or administrative interest in your role. And we're going to get to that. But essentially, yes, you can get gifts from your husband or spouse that also lives in the city or, you know, from a friend can order you flowers. And that would not have a, would not trigger any of these laws. Gifts with an aggregate value of $50 in a calendar year from a source with a legislative or administrative interest. So I like to use myself as an example for this one. So, you know, I'm a contractor with the city. So I have an administrative or, um, I have an administrative issue, interest in the city. So if I came every day and I brought, you know, if I came one day and I brought a cup of coffee for Bruce or I brought a cup of coffee for the counselor, that's fine. That cup of coffee right now is less than $50. 
maybe that will not be true in another year from now, but that would be fine. You know, that is not me, you know, greasing the wheels or trying to garner favor with gifts to a public official. But if I started doing that every single week for an entire year, that's going to get over the $50 limit. And that's going to start being an abusive office for whoever I'm, whatever public official I'm buying, um, I'm buying gifts for. So it is totally fine if somebody with a legislative or administrative interest buys you a cup of coffee, takes you out for lunch once, you know, gets you a small gift for Christmas. However, as a public official, you need to track that. You know, is it one gift? Is it five gifts? What is the value of those gifts? And a lot of times they're unsolicited. Do you have to send that gift back? Yeah, you know, sometimes you do. And, you know, it is on you. It's not me that's going to get in trouble if I buy uh, Robin a cup of coffee every single day for an entire year. It's Robin. So you need to be aware of that as a public official and feel free to say no. So a gift is anything of economic value, but excludes things as such as a gift from relatives or member of your household of the public official, gifts in the form of plaques, trophies, mementos with a resale value of $25, and a gift as part of a private, um, private business, employment, or volunteerism. And then there's several other exemptions from gifts that I didn't put down in here. But when you're looking at gifts, what you need to ask yourself is, you know, what is the source of this gift? Could the source of this gift reasonably have a legislative interest in my role with the city or an administrative interest in the role of my city, with the city? And then second, what's the value of this gift? Is it over $50? Have they given me any other gifts this year? So you need to take that into account when you're accepting the gift and realize that it's the onus is on you. And I say it one more time, like sometimes you just have to say no, that, you know, thank you for this gift, but I can't accept it. So I'm going to move on to conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest and abuse of office can actually cover some of the same ground, but a conflict of interest arises when a decision or recommendation you're making would or could result in a financial benefit or detriment to you, your relatives, or any business for which you are associated. So conflicts come in two forms, actual or um, potential. So again, Conflicts of interest, and one thing that comes up a lot in the smaller communities, conflicts of interest does not mean something that makes you uncomfortable. It is not, you know, we're talking about my neighbor's property. It makes me uncomfortable. It's going to put me in an awkward decision. So I'm not going to make a land use decision about that person's property. I have a conflict because he's my really good friend. That's not a legal conflict. The only time a legal conflict comes into play is if you, a relative or business for which you're associated with, stands to avoid a financial loss or have a financial gain from a decision that you're going to make in your role as a public official. So again, same with abuse of office, this is all about dollars. So if there's money involved, then it could potentially be a conflict of interest. And the difference between an actual and a potential conflict of interest is this. An actual conflict of interest arise when any decision or act by you would definitely result in a financial benefit um, or avoiding a financial de detriment to you, your relatives, or a business for which you're associated with. So you know definitely if you award the contract to your sister's janitorial service, that jan janitorial service will benefit financially. That is a very clear actual conflict of interest. But let's say instead the decision is to approve an RFP, a request for proposals for janitorial services, for which you know your sister's firm is going to apply. That is not a guaranteed financial benefit to a business for which one of your relatives is associated with. But for participation in that decision would be a potential conflict of interest because it could result in a financial benefit to your sister's business. So this can get a little bit cloudy. You know, when is it a definite decision? When can it actually be, when it will actually result in a financial benefit? When is there, you know, some questions about whether it will take effect, especially with a board of commission. 
you know, we're making a recommendation to the city council, and then the city council is going to make a final decision. So when you're involved with the decision, you know, like there's one step between, you know, your recommendation and a final decision being made. I still like to err on the side of caution if it's an actual conflict. If you are recommending the city council award a contract to your sister's business, my preference would be for you to treat that as a actual conflict of interest and not participate. However, there are other people and other attorneys out there that says that that is a potential conflict because you don't know how the city council is going to vote. The city council could say, thanks for your recommendation, we're making our own decision. But then you get into an area where it's like, well, how often do they rubber stamp your decisions? Like, do you believe strongly that in making this recommendation, the city council is going to rubber stamp it and your sister's business and get that, your sister's firm is going to get that business? I personally wouldn't want to put myself in that situation. So if I'm at the board and commission level, if I'm faced with a, what I would consider an actual conflict, I would treat it as such. So how do you treat a conflict of interest? And I want to be really specific that this is for elected officials. So for an elected or appointed official, when you have a conflict, when it's an actual conflict, you have to announce the conflict each and every time that matters on the agenda or comes up at your meeting. Once you announce the actual conflict of interest, you have to refrain from participation in any official action, including any discussion on the matter. This one I once went a couple rounds with the city councilor about. He had a spouse who was a public employee and in the union, and he wanted to participate in the discussions about the union contract, but then would not make the final vote because he knew that was an actual, an actual conflict. The issue with that is, is that if you have an actual conflict, you can't participate at all. You not only can you not participate in the vote, you also can't participate in any discussions. So again, I'm pretty cautious. My recommendation to the councils that I work with is that if you have an actual conflict of interest and your body is discussing that matter, I step down from the dais. I you know, turn off my screen when I'm on Zoom. I make some sort of physical barrier between myself and, um, and the issue. So I show that I'm not participating at all. For a potential conflict, all you have to do is announce the potential conflict every time the issue arises. So once you announce it, you know, if it comes up at another meeting, you have to announce it again. And then after you make your disclosure, and your disclosure does not have to be specific, like I stand to gain $5,000 from this decision. You don't need to give any personal information like that. All you have to say is that I have a potential conflict and describe the nature of the conflict because the business that we're talking about, you know, employs my sister. And then you can go ahead and participate in the discussions in any of the votes. My strong recommendation is that if you think you could potentially have a, poten a potential conflict of interest, even if there's like four potentials in the, in the discussion, you know, if we issue the RFP, then if my sister's firm decides to vote on it, you know, then I could have a conflict. It's worth it to announce it. You know, it's not, it's not a lot of process. All you have to say is I have this conflict and then you go on participating. So I, there's very little downside to announcing the conflict. So I recommend that you do. So there are exceptions to conflict of interest. Um, one of them is the definition of business does not include nonprofits where the associated public official receives um, no remuneration, they receive no financial benefit. And the second one is the class exception. So, you know, Class exception is really difficult because that's a decision that's made at the Oregon Government Ethics Commission level, considering the facts on the ground. So this comes up a lot in planning commission. Let's say that you own a piece of property in the commercial downtown or a residential piece of property, and you're making a recommendation or decision about rezoning that property from um, residential to commercial. And in doing so, that will impact the value of your property. So that could either be an actual or potential conflict of interest, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, but it affects you and it affects half of the city. So in that situation, you are likely part of the class. And because the class is big enough, you can participate in, um, in the discussion and the vote. 
the issue is, and I noted, I noted it before, is that it's hard to know if the group of people that you are part of actually constitutes a class. Where it is clear, and I think this is a really good example, is when members of the city council are making decisions, for instance, about utility bills. You know, what are the utility rates for the city going to be? Any vote that they make on that clearly is going to impact them financially as a resident of the city who owns property. But because that decision literally impacts everybody in the entire city, um, you qualify for the class exception and you do not have to declare any sort of conflicts before you vote on that. Okay. I'm going to really quickly touch on confidential information. All this text really says that you cannot gain financially from confidential information that you gain through your role as a public official. So. You should not use confidential information that you gain otherwise, but specifically if it is, if you're gaining from that confidential information financially, that is a very specific violation of these rules. All right, so let's say that there is a violation of the Oregon government ethics rules. You know, what are you looking at? So first, um, you could have a civil penalty issued against you by the Oregon Gover Government Ethics Committee up to $5,000. You could be removed from office. Um, if you have been found, found to have benefited from a violation, you may be required to forfeit twice the amount of the process, profit, and then in rare cases, there can be criminal sanctions. Um, I've been doing this 10 years, and I have yet to see um, even any mention of criminal sanctions. I think it has to be exceptionally egregious uh, for, that to, um, for that to be triggered. So what are the takeaways? I think I hit them pretty hard, but what should you be on the lookout for as a member of a board of commission or a city council? You know, is the action that I'm going to take um, going to uh, impact me financially? Is it going to impact a relative or a business financially? If that is the case, then you need to take a step back and ask yourself, is this an abuse of office question or do I have a so one of the other things um, before I move away from this topic that is a little bit of a difficult situation is, so I ha you have these questions, who do you go to? Who do you ask about this? These are all issues that are private and specific to the member of the board of commissioner and the member of the council. So officially, this is personal liability. This is not city liability. My role as a city attorney is to be the attorney for the entity, be the attorney for the city. So because of that distinction, if you bring me an issue, I can't actually provide you legal advice on it because that in itself is abuse of office because you're getting free legal advice that you wouldn't get but for your role as a public official. So do I still get these questions all the time? Yes. Um, what I typically do is I explain what the law says without giving any legal advice. And then I advise the public official to contact the Oregon Government Ethics Commission. The Oregon Government Ethics Commission has um, a great website with a phone number on it that if you call, you get a person. And that person helps you out and will answer your questions. So that is the best place to go. And if you forget that, you end up calling me or you end up calling somebody at the city that calls me, I will remind you. I'll tell you what the law is and remind you who to call. So before I move on, any questions about abuse of office for conflicts of interest? Robin, I can see one brewing. Well, I was, there was a part that I had a question about that. Um, well, looks like we have, I can't remember what it was now. Looks like we have clay, so clay. What is the, um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. What, so let's say you don't um, declare a uh, conflict of interest, but either through the conversation or, you know, second guessing yourself, you decide to abstain. How is abstaining, when should we, I guess I'm trying to think about how to use abstaining and, and when we shouldn't use it um, or, or what it doesn't gain for us, put another way. Say, say I don't declare a, a conflict. I am in the conversation about the issue and then I abstain. I can see why that would be a problem. I'm, mm -hmm. I guess I'm just trying to understand the, the the tool in abstaining a little better. And maybe you're going to talk about that later, but it is something that I, you know, we've heard tonight, we've used before, I've used uh, where I thought there might be some issue there. 
but it seems like there could be a hybrid on that where you where you're in the conversation and you still elect to abstain. Okay, I think I understand your question. So if it's an act, actual conflict of interest, if you have if somebody you or somebody you're associated with is going to gain financially from the decision that you're gonna make, you know, you have that conflict from the beginning. Does it happen that people don't realize they have a conflict of interest until you know you have been discussing something for a meeting or two? And then you start remembering this conversation. You start remembering that, hey, that's actually my brother's business that we're talking about. So I personally have a conflict. Like, how do you put the toothpaste back in the tube? Is that your question? It is along that line. That's that's one piece of it. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to understand abstaining a little better. But, you know, if there's a specific question there, it's what happens if you, if you walk into the conversation and through the conversation, you realize you do have a conflict. Um, right. Do you abstain? I'm staying out there? Yeah, so I would tell you at that point, you know, not giving you legal advice, but, you know, point you in the direction of declaring it. And, you know, the, the next opportunity, I would say that you say, you know, after further discussion with this, I realize I have a conflict of interest. I'm going to excuse myself from the conversation. So you may have already participated in some conversations before that. Um, and that is perhaps a technical violation. If it's an actual conflict, you had that from the beginning, it's a technical violation. However, you know, when you realized it, you did the right thing and rectified it to the extent that you could. And by that point, you know, you're just talking about it. You haven't made any sort of vote on the matter. So, you know, although a technical violation, you corrected it the best that you could. And the same is true with the potential is that I think this comes up more often than an actual, is that you do realize that there could be a potential for you to benefit financially in the future. And in that case, it's totally fine for you to participate in the conversations. You just need to start announcing from then, from then going forward. Right. Does that okay. get, to, get to your question? It, it, it helps. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. I'll keep moving. Um, so this one I'm going to go through. I think the ethics, the conflicts of interest, and the abuse of office are the thing that I wanted to hit on the hardest tonight because um, I do think they are the ways that well-meaning public officials, you know, can get tripped up for exactly as Clay mentioned without even realizing it. Um, so I'm going to pick up the case as I go through these. So public meetings, you know, what are public meetings? What, um, what bodies are subject to the law? So elected and appointed officials must meet in public to deliberate and decide on matters of public policy. Oregon, if you haven't picked up on it so far, so far has very strong transparency laws. All of these laws are about transparency that, you know, if you have an interest in a decision that has been brought before the public and also for the public to have access, but not necessarily participation, in all deliberations of public bodies. So the public meetings laws are designed to elicit public access, not necessarily participation. So every body that we're talking about here tonight is a public body that is, um, that is covered by the Oregon public meetings laws. One thing that I do think trips up groups is that officially sanctioned public bodies are obviously governing bodies of the public body. However, if your public body, if your commission, if your design review commission, if your planning commission forms a subgroup and that subgroup is authorized to make a recommendation to the advisory committee, that subgroup is also a public body subject to public meetings laws. So I think that is one area that I have noticed with my clients, they maybe don't realize that. So you know, if you are on the design review board and you are asking for a subcommittee to research shingles and bring you back a recommendation on what sort of shingles code the, um, the city should have, you know, but you just think it's easier if two or three people meet on their own to come to make the recommendation to the subcommittee to recommendation to the city council, it's not as easy as that. When those three people meet, they need to meet in a public meeting. So when I say um, require, what is a public meeting? So again, transparency. There has to be notice of the time and place and that notice must be reasonably calculated to inform interested persons. So usually 24 hours in advance 
And again, there's not a lot of hard and fast laws. It is reasonable person. You know, you do not have to make sure that you go through Cannon Beach and let every single person you know that that your body is meeting. It has to be reasonably calculated not to hide the ball from the public. Um, personal notice must be given to those who have requested it. So, if, you know, you have a particular issue, they have somebody has requested notice every time that becomes before the city council, then you do have to provide that notice. Principal subjects to have to be discussed. You have to be specific enough to pers permit a person to decide if he or she feels it necessary to attend. Um, that does not prohibit adding or adjusting the agenda the night of. I know Cannon Beach doesn't have any problem with that. We do a lot of uh, adjusting the agenda the night of. Um, other public bodies um, do not understand that that is fine. So you're doing your best. If you know that you're gonna discuss something in advance, you should put it on the agenda so the public knows. However, you know, work needs to get done. Things come up during the day of a city council meeting. It is totally fine to adjust the agenda the night of. <clears throat> Um, location considerations, again, just to keep moving, it generally must be within the city unless, um, unless a, uh, one of these exceptions apply. Um, new in 2020, um, meetings may be conducted by telephone or electronically if the public has access. Um, so now uh, we have to have all public meetings have um, a way for the public to access the public meeting um, telephonically or electronically. And if testimony is taken publicly, I'm sorry, testimony is taken in person. Individuals also have to have a means to be able to take that testimony electronically. So that's new from COVID. Um, it has to be significantly sized room to, um, to expect interest in, to expected interest in the meeting. Again, back in my marijuana days, there were, you know, sometimes we'd have a public meeting in a room that was seriously insufficient for the interest in the subject matter. And so a public body would have to have auxiliary space available. It's made easier now with Zoom because we can just, people can just Zoom in. Um, votes must be tallied and attributed to each member of the governing body, may use paper ballots, but cannot vote in secret. So this comes up a lot, or used to come up a lot of times in voting or appointing members to certain boards and commissions. The city council would vote, you know, they'd write down who they want on a card, it would come back and you'd find out who the appointed person was. Um, that is insufficient because it is, um, you should be able to tell what member of the body voted for which person or on every single matter, you should be able to pull a complete voting record. So minutes don't need to be verbatim, but they do need to be kept. Um, they must include roll call, any motions, resolutions, or actions, the result of votes, and the substance of all discussions. I mentioned this before, but, att before, but attendance versus participation. Um, just because public are allowed access to all public meetings definitely does not mean that the public always gets to participate. Um, Cannon Beach, I think, does a great job of striking the balance of allowing public participation um, without making meetings overly burdensome. Some of my public bodies have allowed public comment on every single agenda item, and we routinely have four-hour meetings. So I think um, I think Cannon Beach does a nice job of striking that balance. Um, there are some types of meetings that must allow public participation, specifically land use, and then right-of-way, and any sort of increase of fees or charges. So along with conflicts of interest and, um, and abuse of office, this is the other topic that I want to spend some time on. So a pub properly noticed public meeting, I think is pretty easy. If you have an agenda item, you're meeting with your body to do the, the city's business, super easy, you know the boxes that you need to check. However, Oregon has two separate laws. We have a law about meetings of the governing body um, that shall be open to the public and all persons shall be permitted to attend. That's what we just talked about. The second provision of Oregon law is the prohibition on private meetings. And this got a lot of attention back in 2012 um, because some commissioners in Lane County got in trouble repeatedly um, for violation of this provision. And as a result, we got some great case law out of it. Not great case law, clarifying case law. I'll just put it that way. So this says a quorum of the governing body may not meet 
in private for the purposes of deciding on or deliberating towards the decision on any matter except for executive sessions. So if a quorum, so typically a majority of your body meets in private and talks about matters that they could later vote on, that is an illegal public meeting. So I think that is relatively easy to discern when you're talking about an in-person meeting. However, the case law through the handy cases in a case out of TriMet um, clarified a few things. So first let's talk about the definition of a meeting, meaning the convening of a governing body for which a quorum is required to attend in order to make a decision or deliberate on any matter. Meetings do not include on-site inspection and they do not include the attendance of a member of the governing body in any national region um, or association. So there are some exclusions for a meeting. So your guys' site <laughs> visits, those aren't meetings even if a quorum of people are there. And we talked about quorum, you know, that's the minimum number of people um, that must participate in order for a body to transact business. Um, typically majority is the of the body is equal to the quorum. Um, each year municipal code defines what a, what a quorum is. The only time this comes up is if there's vacancies. So let's say that you have a board of five and you have two vacancies. So what's your quorum? The quorum is, is um, if you have two vacancies, your quorum is two, because that is the majority of the seats that are filled. So a gathering of less than a quorum is not a meeting. So this also comes up a lot too. You know, can if you have five members of a committee, all five seats are filled, can two people meet and talk about the business of that board? Yes, that is not a public meeting because less than a quorum are available or at that meeting, unless you've been delegated authority by your commission to bring back a recommendation on something. In that case, those two people are a subcommittee. So that's sort of a, a nuance to look out for. So subcommittees of a body constitute governing bodies in of themselves, and as such, the quorum would be a majority of the subcommittee. And we already talked about this, a quorum of go governing body may not meet in private um, to deliberate on something that they would decide on. Ashley? Yeah. What if they met and then one of the two people called a third person? Oh, we're getting there. Okay. Those, are, those are the Lane County decisions. So, um, so first of all, I talked about the easiest way to distinguish a prohibited public meeting is when everybody is meeting in, per in person. So does that mean that members of the community can no longer gather socially? Cannon Beach is a small town. I'm sure that you have a lot of Christmas parties. You end up at the same soccer games. You end up at the same grocery store. You're also like-minded individuals who probably have a lot of common and hopefully like each other. Can you never meet socially? The answer to that is no. However, if a quorum is present at any of these social gatherings, be very careful not to discuss whatever the topic of your committee is. With city council, like, just stay away from any topic that has to do with the city. I think city councilors have the most onerous, um, are in the most onerous position there because almost anything can come to the city council level. But if you are the parks committee and there is a land use matter, you know, that's not something that you're going to be asked to vote on. So a quorum of a parks committee can talk about something that doesn't have to do with their commission at all. But be cognizant, at some point such discussions may turn into social gatherings and that can turn into a meeting. One of my other councils just loves after the council meeting to go across the street to the local bar and have a couple drinks after the council meeting, which I get, you know, sometimes you just want to cool down, but it certainly looks like an illegal public meeting when you have all your public officials sitting around. What are they talking about? So I would be very cognizant of social gatherings um, if you have a form of your, meeting, of your committee that you are not discussing something you can later vote on. So here's the issue, and I, there's a lot of text on here, so I'm just gonna break it down. So in these cases out of Handy and out of TriMet, what they decided is that you can violate the public meetings laws without meeting contemporary, com contemporaneously. So a quorum, of a public body can meet in private, even if you're not all in the same room at the same time. How does that happen? That can happen over email, that can happen over text message, that can happen over next door, and that can happen over Facebook. The elements are that you have a quorum of your public body, 
and you are discussing something that you are later going to have to vote on. If those elements are present, then you have violated the Oregon public meetings laws. So how this came up in, um, in Lane County a couple of years ago was, was twofold. So first, members of, Lane, members of county commissions are actually employed of the, employees of the county. So they have offices along in a row and a member of staff went door to door to the commissioners and had a conversation with each one of the commissioners and shared what the other commissioners had to say. So essentially they used a staff person to, um, to have a deliberation. They used, um, they used him to have a conversation without ever meeting in public. He was a conduit. And that went to the Oregon Supreme Court and that's when the Oregon Supreme Court says that you can violate the Oregon public meetings laws without actually meeting in person if you have a serial communicator. And that guy was, you know, the conduit that allowed them to deliberate without it being public. So by the time they got to the commission meeting, they knew what each other, they knew what everybody was voting on. They'd had all the discussions and the meeting was essentially a sham. So that's Lane County number one. So those public officials stayed in their job. They were issued um, some pretty substantial fines. And one of them decided to do a fundraising campaign. And there was a letter that was sent to the commission. And the letter was about some of the legalities of that commissioner raising money. So then they're going to decide if they're going to have an executive session about this letter. And what happened was two members of the commission had an email exchange. And then one member of that commission then made a phone call to a third member of the, the commission and shared what the other two members said. So all of a sudden you have a serial communication. You have two people on an email chain and you have one person on a phone call. So the takeaway from that is that serial meetings occur when a series of communications of any kind directly or through intermediaries to discuss, deliberate, or take action takes place between a quorum of a governing body. This is even true, though at no given time does a quorum of the governing body communicate, communicate contemporaneously about the topic in question. So what does this mean for you guys as public officials? Please don't reply all. I mean, that is the easiest thing that you can do. If there's an email communication, a lot of times, you know, the city will send information out. It is information I always put at the bottom. Please don't reply all. You can certainly reply to me, you can certainly reply to Bruce, you can certainly reply to Jen. But the issue is if you do a reply all, you start getting in, you could potentially start getting into a deliberation scenario. If it's about whether you're available for the meeting on Wednesday, no, not a violation of the Oregon public meetings laws, but it's a bad habit to get in because that can very easily become deliberation from something that you're gonna vote on. The other one is social media. There is no case law that has decided this, but the way the cases are going, you know, social media can be used. If you are on Nextdoor or Facebook or whatever the latest social media is, and you see that, you know, three members of the city council have already chimed in and given an opinion on something that's being discussed, you know, I guess three here would be more than a quorum. If two have already, you know, weighed in on that, please don't be the third one. Because again, like, when the first person commented, they were just commenting. When the second person commented, you know, that was two, that's less than a quorum. As the third person, it's gonna be a public meeting violation for all three, even though the first two, you know, had no way to anticipate the third was gonna happen. I am hoping there's a legislative fix coming on this because again, you know, if Robin calls a member of the council, you know, has a conversation and that's totally fine on something they're gonna vote on, and then she, that person she calls, then calls two other members, Robin has been inadvertently dragged into a, a public meeting, even though she really did nothing wrong. So there are some loopholes, there are some issues to be aware of. Um, so my takeaways from that are just be cognizant of how you use email, how you use text messages, and how you use um, social media when you are discussing something that you could later be required to vote on. So again, much more onerous for city council because that's almost everything that has to do with the city. For you, uh, members of board of commission, you just need to be aware of your topic. 
Um, so again, just the closing slide, no non-contemporaneous communications involving a majority of the governing body in the aggregate, discussing or deliberating on a topic that you may later discuss or deliberate on in a public meeting. That could be in violation of the Oregon public meetings laws. I'm not really gonna touch on executive sessions um, because boards and commissioners don't typically have them. You can, you can have executive sessions. Executive sessions are typically just the city council for a very limited amount of topics and they are strictly construed and no final decision can be made in executive session. Um, so I'm just gonna, so best practices, I think I already hit on these pretty hard. I think, um, I think we all understand, you know, my perspective and my advice to you on public meetings laws. Any questions before I head into public records? No? Oh, I got a hand from the phone. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. So what if I send out an email and uh, let's say it's to uh, uh, three, what are best practices for the people receiving that, the, my fellow uh, commission members, what is their best practice um, relative to responding, not responding to that email? So let me make sure I heard you right. You received an email that was sent out by our quorum of people already involved in this. Is is that the scenario you're talking oh, about? No. So I, I was suggesting that I let's say I send out an email, and mm -hmm. I have three other of three other commission members in that email copy. So a quorum. Mm -hmm. What is their best practice to that email they receive? Should they respond, hey, this is a quorum? Should they ignore the email? What is our best practice when, we, when we're in that situation? Right, so if I was a member of that commission who received an email and it was deliberating on a matter or at least expressing opinions on a matter that I would later vote on, I would tell you from a technical perspective, only one person has expressed an opinion at that point. So as you know, going lawyer, I would say that there's been no deliberation because it's just one person passing along their information. The real violation starts when multiple people start expressing opinions. That okay. being said, I would say that, you know, let's say a public meeting violation has occurred. It happens, you know, these, these things happen. How do you correct this error? At your next public meeting, you bring that information into the public, into the public meeting because the real issue is transparency, that these things shouldn't be happening, not within the public view. So how do you correct that? You bring that conversation into the public meeting. And frankly, like because the law has not frankly been fixed on this yet, I think that these things end up happening quite a bit. You know, like I accidentally got into this conversation or I didn't realize this email got forwarded to me, what do I do about it? Well, you bring it up at your next meeting. You make sure that all the information that was discussed in that email chain gets discussed in public. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, that's helpful. It, it seems like that sort of thing is no big deal at first. Like if you someone responds, it's not a bigger deal, and and we we would have to make it public. So it's just one of those. I guess we just have to be really careful about the emails because that seems like where, where we have the greatest likelihood of, of that breakdown is in, in emails back and forth. Yeah, emails, that's that's why you almost always see a please don't reply all on an email from the city. And if we get an email, often we'll send it to Jen so she can send it to everybody that's on the council. Yeah, so purely information is fine. So like there'll be an occasion where I send out an email, just like the council should be aware of X, Y, and Z. And I send it out to the council for, for informational purposes only. I will ask council not to reply all. You can talk to me about it or you're sending information out. I believe that the council should know about this. It is a one-way transmission of information. That is fine. It is deliberation or discussion. It is multiple hanging in and sharing opinions and having a discussion that should be had in public. That's what the law is designed to do. You know, does it snare more than it should? Probably, um, but that's, yeah, that situation is fine. 
Yep, actually, I, I worked in some state, I think it was Idaho, where they uh, had a strict law or they wouldn't allow you to even poll in preparation for the immigration. So right. Poll on an issue. Mm -hmm. Is that in Oregon? I haven't heard it brought up. Right. You have to be careful. So, um, so yeah, a lot of times, you know, government still needs to function, I would say, among, um, among all of these laws. And so I would say that it is totally fine for somebody to pull members of the council. Where you run the risk is cross-contamination. So, you know, are, when you're taking a poll, are you sharing, you know, what, what the results of the poll up to that point? Or are you saying, you know, um, how are you going to vote on this issue? Here's what Robin thinks. Or, you know, again, I'm very cautious of that. Have I adjusted what I'm telling people from the other conversations that I've gotten? So let's say that there's like a legal issue that I want to have a conversation with each counselor with. You know, I will write out a script. Like, this is what I'm sharing with each one of the counselors. So everybody's getting the exact same piece of information. I'm not cross-contaminating, and I'm also not adjusting based on other questions so, so, yes, you can pull, but also, yes, you should be pretty careful about how you do it. So when you send out information to the counselors, do you send it separately or do you send it as a group? Um, I send it as a group. So t the typical practice. It's just a do not reply all. Do not reply all. And, um, you know, that's how Bruce does it too. Bruce, you know, all the counselors need, you know, X, Y, and Z information. He'll send it out. And I am not aware of there being an issue at Cannon Beach of, of counselors responding. Maybe it's, you know, the gravity of this presentation a couple a couple times over again where people know not to reply all, but I have not seen that as an issue here at all. Thank you, pretty good. Yeah, you don't reply all. <laughs> um, so any other questions? I think those, so the conflicts of interest of use of office and the issues around prohibited public meetings, those are sort of my high high priority topics for this sort of presentation. Um, so any other questions before I move on? Okay. I don't think that you need to know a ton about public records. Yep. Please tell us. What was that? Oh, wait. Clay, do you still have your hand up or is that residual? I think it's... Okay. No, oh, I... I'm Okay, I don't see us. Okay. Um, Actually, I did this little quick question. Yeah. So, in a, I'm trying to phrase this correctly, so in a case where an email goes out to the committee mm -hmm. and you want to respond, and what ends up happening is that that, that email train gets put in the packet. Mm -hmm. It becomes public. Is that sufficient to? Yeah, I mean, what all we'll say is that a technical violation probably occurred, you know, right. through that through that email chain if it was deliberation. But you know, is it cured by putting it in the public packet? I would argue that yes, it was still a violation, but any damage done by that is rectified by it being made public. Um, so, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Mike Bates emailed me a question. Yeah. He um, asked, what is delegation? Well, that's a really good question. Um, do you know what context you mean with that? No, they just questioned regarding public meeting and what is delegation. So I'm going to go ahead and guess that's about forming subcommittees. So what is a delegation to a subcommittee that makes that subcommittee a public body? I'm going to guess that's where he's going. And there's no, there's no bright line rule about that. You know, my preference is, you know, some sort of written resolution that delegates authority to these three members of council to do X, Y, and Z. That is a very clean delegation of authority. When they're doing that, they're very clearly acting within their scope as, you know, the subcommittee. It can also just be a motion, you know, like I delegate authority to these two people to negotiate the city manager contract. You know, that does become a subcommittee. Um, but that is in a proper delegation of authority. It can also be delegated through adoption of policies. So everything in your, you know, whether or not does a department head, the city manager have authority to take X, Y, and Z action, it can be delegated through your personnel handbooks, can be delegated through job descriptions, 
Um, there's any number of ways, both formal and informal, to delegate authority. So I hope that answers this question. We'll see. Can I ask a question? Yes. So what Les was referring to with the email, um, and then if, if it's not quite technically okay, that you put it in the packet and that kind of corrects, sort of, but you wouldn't want to use that as a practice. No. 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 Um, I mean, best practice is yeah. to deliberate in public. Yeah. But again, what you're asking about is like, do volunteers make mistakes? You know, yes, we're all busy people. And, you know, there's no intention to do something outside of the public eye. And so, yes, it could be a violation, but the damage has been rectified. And so I'm not going to say it's not a big deal, um, but the damage is pretty limited. Okay, I heard back from Mike. He says, what if members less than a quorum decide to discuss changes to code regarding land use on their own? Not a delegation. So in that case, like let's say that you are having some cocktails with your friend and you guys are talking about something that you're later going to bring back to the commission that you're on. Nobody has delegated authority to do anything. You're just having some, some really good ideas going back and forth over some martinis. You know, that is fine. If there is some sort of official delegation, then you need to be careful. Well, he just raised his hand. Clay? Can you hear, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so this, this kind of goes along the lines of Mike's question. I just want to make sure I'm clear. If let's say the planning commission passes a resolution to form a subcommittee on a particular item, and we have a, a seven member commission and we delegate three people to that subcommittee. Does that subcommittee then, are they subject to uh, rules of public notice if two out of three get together or are they not subject to public notice if only three out of a seven member greater panel get together? Great question. And the answer is if they have been delegated authority, they are an independent subcommittee of the planning commission that is subject to the Oregon public meetings laws. So if two of you get together and deliberate on that topic, then that is a public meeting that needs to be noticed. Well, okay, so then let's just talk practically for a minute. There are some mm -hmm. issues that because of public notice, there's concern if it won't happen as quickly as, as there needs to be some ideas. If three members of the planning commission get together and talk about it and informally come back to the planning commission with a couple of ideas at a formal meeting, is that okay? That would be fine if there has been no delegation of authority for that subcommittee to make a recommendation to the commission. Okay. Okay. I think like we're going in, oh, we're going into some technical areas and I think that's fine. I think it's important to recognize like what is the purpose? The purpose is that yes, government needs to function and sometimes individual conversations of less than the quorum need to happen, but for groups of people that have the ability on their own to be a voting block that makes a recommendation that could later become public policy, all of those discussions should be in public. And that's what the law is designed to do. And again, Laws are perfect and it does snare a lot of situations that could potentially slow down the public function. But, you know, the weight here is in favor of transparency over speed. Yeah, it's also just the burden on the city right now. I mean, there's so many items in front of the city that, you know, while we have some critically important items that need to be addressed, we also have some monstrous undertakings that have uh, as you said at the beginning of the meeting, absolutely tapped our, our city council and the planning commission. And it's, you know, it's, it comes down to kind of a, how do we practically get this done? Um, and not trying to hide anything, but just trying to, to how to work within a system that, that is tapped right now and doesn't have either the, the bandwidth from time uh, from each member's uh, personal standpoint to just the process. You know, we have so many things in front of us right now. Yes, I mean, so what I you've given me is really helpful. It'll help, it'll help me navigate through it. Thank you. That was the goal uh, for this Go evening is, is to sort of shine some light on this. And 
yeah, I mean, these laws, they were formed in 1974, 1976, you know, on the heels of Watergate, and they weigh very heavily in favor of transparency. And I totally get it. I mean, a lot of the issues that I deal with on a day to day basis are, you know, how do we get this done in a way that makes sense? And it is hard when your council, when your council meets eight to 10 times a month, which is astounding. Um, so you do have a lot of opportunities to do business, but I understand what you're saying. Um, I think we have a question from Anita. Yes, hello. Um, I'm wondering who has jurisdictions over uh, any violations um, regarding any meeting between two committee members or um, just a, a community um, citizen and um, how, how that would go forward in, in being discovered and dealt with? That's a great question. So executive sessions are dealt with under the Oregon Government Ethics Commission. So violations of executive session go to the Oregon Government Ethics Commission and they deal with it. Um, violations of Oregon public meetings laws do not. So those would go to circuit court. Okay, but I, I guess I'm trying to get to the point of, you know, so you've got some committee members that have an agenda item that they know is coming up. And to be able to discuss that seems like a prudent way to be able to um, publicly um, meet um, within chambers and make a yeah. decision. So, I mean, at what point does, you know, somebody say, well, you, you had a, uh, unethical meeting between three of you just to discuss it. I mean, how, how, how is the discovery actually, um, determined for ethics? I mean, it's the normal litigation process. Um, so, yeah, so in that case, it would be a member of the public um, filing the lawsuit and then, you know, normal, normal discovery process. But I think what your question actually is, is frustration about not being able to have preliminary discussions before a, a public meeting. Yeah. And I do think that there is a balance here. And it's whether or not those discussions involve a voting block that could pass a recommendation or a decision without those decisions being in public. So, you know, members of the city council, two members can talk about whatever they want. They can talk about anything in front of the Robin and Nancy can go to each other's house and talk all night long about things that have to do with the city. They can hash out issues. They can have those discussions. The issue is if they involve a third member and they become a voting block, and then all of the discussions that lead to the, the decision happen outside of the public eye. So I think, I think that is the balance, is that it can't involve a quorum. It can't involve a voting block. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. And I think that one of the dangers of today's age, especially Zoom and Facebook and all this new media that we have, is the dangers of the well, if two members are recording something, uh, you know, or in a meeting of another uh, committee or whatever, and those two members are on, and uh, you know, in the quorums, and then you watch that or you uh, mm -hmm. do your Facebook stuff and uh, comment on these things, that's where the dangers, I think, uh, of of the world we live in now, uh, of these inadvertent quorums and you know, kind of the polling of of really decisions in the future uh, take place. And I think that that's the worry uh, I have as a, you know, as a step uh, in how these things are starting to accumulate out there. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think Jeff makes a really good point and that's why we're sort of waiting for some sort of legislative fix or legislative update because these laws were drafted, you know, 20 or 30 years ago when we did not Zoom. We did not have Facebook. You know, email wasn't around. So I do think that um, that an update is necessary for exactly those reasons. These are really great questions. I don't want to cut anybody off. Um, before I move on, any more? Okay. Um, I seem to have lost my PowerPoint. I think I pressed too many buttons. 
Um, but the last topic that we that I wanted to cover was public records. And again, um, you're not responding to public records requests, so you don't need to know the ins and outs of this. What you do need to know is that any reporting of the city business is considered a public record, no matter the media that it's on. So if you are texting about city business, that is officially a public record. If you are sending emails about the city's business, that is a public record. And the city could get a public records request for, and we do routinely, like all communications to and from members of this commission regarding this topic. And in that case, you know, Jen is going to email you or call you and say, you know, I need you to produce all of your text messages or all of your social media posts or all of your emails regarding this topic. Those are public records. That means that you have to save them. They are, you know, they are subject to Oregon public records retention requirements. And so if you choose to do public business via text messages, via social media, via your personal email account, you also need to be able to provide those records to the city so they can retain them. As public officials, the easiest way to do this is to do everything on your email, your city email account. If you're doing everything on your city email account, you don't need to worry about this issue. And it's very easy for us to respond to public records requests without you having to, to go through you know, your personal email, um, your Facebook or, or so forth to get all of those records. Um, so as board of commissioners, that's the high level public records takeaway is that it, the definition of a public record is very expansive and includes, you know, not just, you know, paper, it includes emails, any sort of media that um, record your work as a city official and that you need to keep those and you may have to provide those to a public records request. Is there a time frame? Um, during the re records retention period, so it is different regarding the type of the substance of the record. So, you know, I would send it to the city and let the city assist with retaining those records on the appropriate schedule. So the city council is the only one that has a city email. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is a really good point. I would develop a Gmail account specific for your role as a board and commissioner. So it's very easy just to do like a Ashley Driscoll planning commission Gmail account and have all the information go to that Gmail account. You can even get that forwarded to your normal email account. And so you don't have to go and check it, but you have all of those emails in one place. All right, so I am just short of my promise, 90 minutes, um, but really good questions. Anything else that I can help answer? Okay. I, I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. All thank you. Sorry about the beginning. That's not going to happen. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'm talking to you. Thanks for doing it. Oh, wait. You're right here. Right. We won't. Don't worry. Yeah.